So, what I mean, what I'm going to tell you about is a dream from my boyhood when I was a boy, uh, which was fulfilled when I was more than 60 years old. <laughs> so, you shall never give up your dreams. <laughs> and um, uh, <clears throat> the reason for my dream was that there was an ex this ex 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 expedition in Denmark called the Galatia One Expedition, which was from 1845 to 47. I, I was not born at that time, but I read about it, and it was a Danish ship, a uh, sail ship, which was sent around the world following this blue line here. You can follow the line here around the world. <coughs> And it had 231 seamen and scientists on board. And it was equipped with 36 cannons. It was a Danish warship. And it was a sail ship. And the purpose was really to a double purpose. It should generate colonies uh, in, around the world. And it should, um, it should uh, uh, also discover new things from nature. And I can tell you that there are still things from that <coughs> expedition with sign boxes and have not been investigated now. So it's, <coughs> it's rather, uh, uh, they came with a lot of things back from that trip. So, but then when I was reading about that, I said, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And um, then in 1950 to 52, there was a new expedition plan, which was called the Galatea II expedition, uh, <clears throat> which was a surplus warship from the Second World War, which was given to the Danish Navy. And it was transformed into a, a expedition ship. And it had 100 seamen and scientists on board, it had three salute ca cannons, and it followed more or less the same route. It didn't pass south of South America because it took the, uh, the, the Panama Canal, but it more or less followed the same route around the world. So <clears throat> that was uh, the second one. And I followed that. It was in some of these weekly magazines, uh, weekly report. And I was reading that every week. Uh, my, my aunt subscribed to that weekly uh, the, uh, the report, uh, that, uh, let's say, that uh, uh, publication. And every time on Tuesday, I jumped on my bicycle and went on my bicycle to my aunt to read the last news from this expedition. And I said, that's what I want to do when I grow up. But at that time, I was eight, eight to 10 years old. So <laughs> it was. Uh, not a real possibility. But then, <clears throat> many years later, in, in 2005, I heard about that there was a new expedition planned, uh, the Galatia Free Expedition. And uh, <clears throat> I said, that's what I always have been dreaming about. How can I get on this expedition? And how can uh, let's say, um, <clears throat> a protein chemist get on a marine biology and also a clinic expedition. So I wrote, made a proposal and I had to make something which is relevant to the sea. So I decided to go for finding new fluorescent proteins. And I'll show you why these fluorescent proteins are interesting. <clears throat> and um, anyway, uh, the, the ship was a Danish, uh, Navy ship, it was one of the biggest ones we have. It's not a very big one, uh, <clears throat> but it uh, it has a, it, it has a length of 112 meters, and uh, it was built in 1988 to 95. There are four for, for them, uh, and the one we were on was this one, the weather on here, and <clears throat> it had a, a cannon on board. 36 millimeter cannon on the front deck up there. And it had uh, 50 seamen and 40 persons on board. 
from scientists and then sent from press and other things because they wanted also to make this a, a, an advertisement for young people to go into science. So I wrote a proposal and miraculously I was accepted. So I was very happy to go there. My son had also written another proposal, uh, but he was not accepted. He wanted to go uh, to an area over here. <clears throat> but you see, at that time, <clears throat> the Danish newspaper had published drawings of Muhammad with, um, so they were kind of, <clears throat> there was a lot of debate and a lot of reactions from Muslim countries. So <clears throat> they decided not to go through the Suez Canal and down this way, but to go south of Africa and not to come to close, uh, anywhere to close uh, Muslim, Muslim countries. So that was the uh, almost killing my expedition because half of my, <clears throat> my plan was to study the Indian Ocean, which is over here. But anyway, I had still uh, the possibility to go to the Solomon Islands, which are up here. And then they gave me instead the possibility to go to the Caribbean, to the Danish Virgin Islands over here. So I was very happy that I come, got, went in on this ship, ship, <coughs> this ship. And this is just what such a ship looks like. And that unfortunately is in Danish, but I can explain you. I mean, <coughs> in this end of the ship, which was a hel helicopter deck, we had no helicopter, but there were containers with laboratories, six containers with laboratories uh, in the after the ship. Um, we were put in, uh, in in the cabins for the crew members out here, and uh, we could move free, freely around on the entire ship, except for one place, the radio room with all the secret nature uh, nature codes. We could not come in without being accompanied. But the rest, we could go up in the top. We could move around on the ship. We would go out in the cannon tower. We could not shoot the cannon, but anyway, we uh, had a free access anywhere. And the helicopter hangar, which was around here, was transformed into a meeting room where we could make lectures for each other and so on. And um, Then I wanted to show you what is the, we want to do. And we wanted to see, to find these proteins which can be used to see what happens in, in the cells. And you see, here you can see how these proteins move around in the cell, the fluorescent proteins. And you have two kinds of light phenomena. <coughs> in nature, you have fluorescence and you have bioluminescence. Uh, fluorescence is that you, illuminate with high energy light, typically UV light, and you get the fluorescence out, it can be blue, and you get fluorescence out in another color, so it changes the wavelengths. Bioluminescence is production of light from bi biologically, and that's what you see in, in quite a lot of uh, animals, for example, the fireflies in, in, in the jungle, in, in your jungle and so on. But we were interested in the fluorescent phenomena. <clears throat> and these fluorescent proteins were first discovered in a place in the, in the US, on the west coast, northwest coast of US. And um, it was in this area here, in the bay. And in the bottom of that bay, you had a big, uh, Marine Biology Laboratory here, and you had a Navy base here. And <clears throat> the problem was that for a long time, the fluorescence was kept secret because when this ship, which is the biggest uh, battleship in the world, came out from the Navy base, from the Navy base, which was around here, uh, what happened was that it left a trace of fluorescence in the water. And this could be seen from the uh, from the uh, uh, satellites 
So the Russians knew exactly when the ship went out and where it went. And that was, of course, not very convenient. So the Americans decided to eliminate the reason for the fluorescence. And as a matter of fact, the fluorescence came from a jellyfish, this one, and it was found that a protein here, which was the DFE, the green fluorescent protein, was the one causing the fluorescence. <clears throat> and um, that is here from this marine biology laboratory. And now I'll give you a little flash course in molecular biology, <clears throat> because these fluorescent proteins have been very much used now in all kinds of molecular biology studies. And what you did was you fished the protein and you fished the DNA, uh, green fluorescent protein DNA, and then you included it and cloned it into a cell. Uh, and then this cell would fluoresce. So you can follow what happens here. And then what you can do then is that you can make a fusion of the, this DNA with a gene from a, a, a protein you want to follow in the cell. And in this case, it's a glucose transporter. It was in the study of uh, diabetes. And you can then see where it goes in the cell. We have it here. You can see it goes rather close to the, uh, uh, the cell uh, core and the cell uh, here. So it was one, and one Danish company worked very hard on that because they are the world's biggest producer of insulin. They wanted to use that to study the uh, diabetes uh, <clears throat> and you take the yeast cells and they fluoresce nicely. And then you take, you see they fluoresce nicely. Then you clone it in human cells, no fluorescence. What was wrong there? They, it worked in yeast, but it didn't work in human cells. You see the difference is that the yeast cells were grown at 20 degrees, whereas the human cells were grown at 37 degrees. So apparently this, uh, it didn't fluoresce at, at this uh, uh, 37 degrees. And where the, this uh, jellyfish came from is quite cold water. So it was adapted to cold water. So they decided to try to change a little, mutate it, and uh, then suddenly they got one which could fluoresce, um, a variant which could fluoresce at 37 degrees. So that is really used a lot in a lot of studies in human uh, cells, cell biology. So what was the mutant which made that? There was a strange little mutant. It was this little phenylalanine was changed. And this is the fluorophore. That is part of the molecule making the fluorescence, this SYG. Uh, but this, if you change this for, for, to an, a leucine uh, instead of a, uh, a phenylalanine, then it can fluoresce a higher temperature. So they made a lot and lot of mutations to find out one which could do it. And as a matter of fact, <clears throat> and I think that's a good message, it has been much more efficient for them to go and look in nature because nature had discovered this mutant already. And um, you see here a lot of different uh, fluorescent proteins have and the GFV2 have this mutant, uh, the uh, F2L mutant. So nature had discovered it already a long time ago, but it took them about two hard, years of hard work and all to, to find this uh, mutant uh, and to make it work. 
So, but anyway, this has been a, a reason for a, lot, a number of Nobel Prizes in, in this uh, fluorescent protein. Osamu Shimomura, he isolated the GFE from the jellyfish and he discovered that it glowed bright green in ultraviolet light. Then Martin Kelly demonstrated that it was used for one to use as a tag to incorporate by genetic engineering into, um, into a different uh, uh, cell, cell types. And then Roger Sin, he, uh, he uh, kind of they made mutations of the GFE gene to also got a, a series of different colors. So this was all uh, uh, a result in, in, in new Nobel Prizes here. So how do they work this? And you can see here is insulin induced movement of the glucose transporter uh, in, in the cell. And if you see here, it moves to different positions in the cell and uh, you can follow it in the cell in, in a confocal microscopy. And here we have activation of immune response where If you look again, we can make maybe one again. You stimulate the cell from immune cells from the outside, and then it goes. The signal goes into the cell core, the core of the cell. So you can follow where in the cell do we have these proteins, or these fusion proteins were made in, in this. As a matter of fact, these fluorescent proteins became very popular. Uh, because you can do uh, imaging in vivo and many places. And here, for example, you have a number of different images. This is the skin protein from naked and eye mice. The airs where the mice is naked. Here you have put a red protein into a tumor cell and then you can follow where it goes, uh, how it metastasis, and it goes to the brain. You can see the red color here. And there was also people employing that commercially by making fluorescent fish for aquarium. <laughs> and that was a gimmick, but I mean, it had one good thing. That was that it showed up that even if you had put this fluorescent protein into the fish, it could, survive in many generations where they continue to be fluorescent. And you had here, down here, you have an interesting thing. This is a, a, a plant uh, and what has been do done is that they have put in a gene which fluoresce when you have explosives around. And um, then they could spread out this on the floor and then they could go with and see if there was uh, uh, fluorescent uh, landmines uh, below the plants. Uh, the problem there was that you had to go very close to see the fluorescence. So <laughs> your chances of surviving anyway was not that good. But it has also been used to see when it's time, for example, to go and uh, uh, water a, a potato fields uh, where you have made fusion with the protein, which is uh, which is uh, involved in, uh, uh, which is synthesized when the plant needs water. We use it also in uh, in, in in the uh, in our studies where we uh, used one protein here, uh, which is called EL for E E L F four E, where we have labeled with green fluorescent protein, and we have another one which is called Geminin five, which is labeled with a red fluorescent protein. And then, if we match these two pictures, we can see that they co-localize in the cell. That will say that they are most likely 
acting in a complex. And that's as a matter of fact, <coughs> was a condition for getting this paper published that we could demonstrate that because um, our referee, the one who suggested, was the one who had <coughs> found the Jimin 5 and he said, this is not interacting with this one. So I, my protein do not interact with this one. He, he was the one finding this protein and we said it is. So it took us a lot of this debate with the editors to get this paper published. But that's life. It took us more than one year and we had to make this uh, confocal microscope studies and make this fusion proteins to get it to work. So, but anyway, I got to know that I had was allowed to under this condition. And I had no experience whatsoever in planning an expedition. So I started to say, what can I do? The first thing is where to go. And I had decided to go for the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific. But as I said, the, the, the Indian Ocean got not uh, part of the expedition ship because of this uh, crisis with the Muslim countries. So, I decided to go for the Western Pacific and then to the uh, Caribbean. Then you realize that you have to get a lot of uh, permissions to go somewhere. Um, so you have to have research permissions in any area you go and you have to find out what is needed of visas. There are a lot of sa safety requirements. Oh. Yeah, there are lots of safety requirements to do with how many and who shall join the team, the physical condition and vaccinations. I mean, you have to have be a reasonably good physical condition. And at that time I was better conditioned than I am now. <laughs> so I was only uh, in the sixties, so that was fine. Uh, <clears throat> but you had to go through a lot of uh, examinations. Uh, you had to get a lot of vaccinations uh, um, to be sure that you, uh, you would not get a lot of diseases. You had to have yellow fever, which I had already because I've been in Brazil, but you also had to get cholera and typhus, paratyphus and a lot of other things. So uh, I, I remember I went to all these vaccinations and I was damn sick for one week after getting a lot of injections. <laughs> but anyway, I got through that. Then we come to the next thing is, how do we get the team and the equipment and the, uh, to, to the places where we work? Because we were not on the ship all the time. Um, the ship had at any time different projects going on. And our project was in two areas in the Western Pacific and in the Caribbean. Then we had to find out how to collect the samples. And of course, we had to train diving and we had to train night diving because we can only see the fluorescence by night. <clears throat> we had to find out how we could make a preliminary analysis of the samples on the ship. What would we need of equipment and chemicals to do that? And I mean, you cannot just go down the corner and buy what you need when you're in the middle of the Pacific. So you have to have everything prepared beforehand. And then how to store the samples and how to get them home. Um, because, <clears throat> I mean, most of the uh, ex examinations of the samples would be done once we get got them home. And then some people were sending their samples on dry ice um, to Denmark by flight. Uh, but I heard already that there were big problems with delays and samples were sold. And so, so we decided to keep them in the minus 80 degree freezer on the ship until it came back to Denmark. And then of course, you have to get the financing to finance the whole project. And that was a moving us all. We had uh, the Danish government paid our stay on the ship and the food, but all the rest I had to, finance myself, equipment and so on. So, and we all had to go on, to, on diving courses and so on. So it took some time to get all this ready. And as I said, 
we were two places, the Solomon Islands, which is up here, and the West Indies uh, and the Danish uh, West Indies Islands, which are out here. So this was the two places where we decided to go. And I would say, <clears throat> in our original plan, we would have been in that area and this area and followed the ship. But now I had to have the whole crew to flying twice uh, out here and then back and then out here and back. So that made it much more expensive, unfortunately. Um, but then we decided we were three of us uh, to um, one of my students, uh, uh, he was a PhD student, and <coughs> one who was a specialist in, in uh, the fluorescent proteins, and then we took over first. And we all passed uh, diving courses and so on. When I went to the, pass a diving course, uh, I, I, they asked me, have you ever died? And I said, yes, when, uh, 40 years ago. <laughs> then they looked at me and I was, I was smoking at the same time. And you were smoking, you would never do it. But I made it anyway. So we were, got our diving certificates and went to there. And then, oops, then we decided that my, my colleagues should fly directly to the so Solomon Islands and start to collect samples, where I would join the ship in Australia and uh, try to arrange the laboratories and everything on the ship on the way up to there. So we met them in, in here. And then later on, we would join the ship again in the Caribbean. And this is the ship, what it looked like. And that ship, was in the Navy Harbor in Sydney. And as a matter of fact, I, I came in after 24 hours flight um, in the night to this harbor and the taxi could only bring me to two kilometers from the ship. So I had to carry all my luggage all the way. And I had 40 some, 60 some kilos of luggage <laughs> with me. So uh, it was quite hard to do that. But when I came to the ship, this guy was receiving me and he immediately saw I came carrying all my luggage, jumped down and was bringing me on board on the ship. And that was already giving a very good atmosphere on the ship. And then after a few days uh, in Sydney, we left, uh, this is a, Sydney Harbour Bridge, and this is the Opera House, which was uh, designed by a Danish uh, architect, uh, the Sydney uh, Opera, and we sailed out of the harbour. And immediately in sea, we started to collect samples. Uh, and one of the projects, which was there all the way around, was collecting all kinds of microorganisms from the sea. And this is one of uh, these nets which have been following the ship. And these guys you see there, they are crew members. The, this gray uh, khaki, the, these are the crew members on the ship. Whereas the ones uh, in normal clothes, that's different scientists of different kinds. So here they came in, the sample, and that was uh, only a few hours after we left the harbor. And it was in the Pacific. And as you can see on this photo, the Pacific was really Pacific. <laughs> I mean, it was flat, beautiful thing. This is on top of the uh, laboratory containers. And it was just to prove that I was on the ship. <laughs> and then <laughs> we took samples in day and night. And a lot of the samples were deep sea samples. So this is a bottom sample from about six kilometers depth where it comes up in the night and we all know exactly when samples are coming in. So we are there to see, and you see most of these people are scientists, but there are a few crew members also there. And we all look excited to see what is coming up of this deep sea. And then it's mainly mud, but the mud was kind of filtered and uh, so on. So find different creatures. And this is one of the scientists, this lady. 
uh, and you can imagine the seamen coming with jokes about a beautiful lady, all full of mud. <laughs> but anyway, um, and this is, was uh, one of the crew members. Uh, she was in the mess. I was all the time in the officer's mess, and she was the one serving for us in the officer's mess. She was a very nice girl, awesome. <clears throat> you see, I had trained a little at home uh, with TFE in uh, cloned into yeast, but I have never worked with any real samples because we don't have coral samples in, in the Danish borders. I didn't believe at least there was. So uh, we came to a small, I would say a reef far out in the nowhere where there was a lighthouse and I was reading about in the Nautical Almanac that this was an interesting one with beautiful coral reefs and, and, and with a lot of sharks and murrains. We, we went there, I, I went out diving there and um, they had said there were a lot of sharks and other things there. So, and I was not allowed at that time to dive with, uh, uh, with air bottles. I was only allowed to snorkel. So I went out snorkeling to find a few corals and take them home uh, to try to investigate them. But uh, shortly after I went in the water, I saw this sea snake coming. And this guy was another project on board. He studied sea snakes from all over the world. So I put the head up and yelled at them in the other boat and said, now a sea snake comes and I'll follow it so he can fish it. And they got it. Uh, and so, and there was a, a new undiscovered type of snake, which was, as a matter of fact, extremely toxic. <laughs> they are nasty things, these uh, sea snakes. You have a lot of them in Brazil too, as a matter of fact. But uh, when the ship was moored there, uh, a lot of people also fished, and that's some fish. That's one of the newspaper reporters, that's one from the crew, and they fished. And we, that created a, a conflict between the scientists and the crew members because the crew members and the newspaper reporters wanted to eat the fish and uh, we wanted to study them. But we, come, we came to a compromise that the, the scientists would get the intestines and the, the meat could be eaten by the others. So that was quite interesting. And that was, she is uh, this lady over there. She is uh, the one who was group leader for our uh, part of the expedition. She is now one of the most important people in the uh, studies of global warming in Denmark now. So, but many strange things came out of the water. You see, some fish like this one came from the deep sea and it can decouple the lower jar to eat something which is much bigger than itself. This is also a deep water fish with very big eyes to see something. This was an interesting thing. It looks like a starfish, but as a matter of fact, it's not a starfish. It is a, a crayfish, which has built up a starfish-like thing so that it's camouflaged. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> The zoologist who saw that was very enthusiastic. He said, that's a uh, Nobel Prize, at least. And he immediately went in uh, to announce that he had found this thing. But a student came, had been Googling, and said, well, he found it in Google, and it's well known. So the professor was kind of <laughs> bad mood after that. So, but I mean, <clears throat> In, it takes quite a long time to sail from Australia up to the Solomon Islands, and it was very hot. So we sometimes got the chance to go swimming uh, when the ship was making deep. I mean, when we took samples from deep water, the ship stayed permanently for a very long time. Uh, and then we got uh, allowed to go swimming. And uh, then uh, one of these... Uh, Zodiacs from the ship 
were circling around us to look out for sharks and then we could go swimming. And, and some of the younger crew members, they dived from some of the ship, which was a 10 meter dive. And when I was young, I also could dive from a 10 meter platform. So I had forgotten that I was not that young anymore. So I went down and jumped. And on the way down, I have regretted it many times, <laughs> but I came down head first and survived anyway. So that's when I came in the water. Uh, I mean, but we could not always uh, get to swim. So we made a kind of a pool, which was some pieces of wood and some uh, plastic. Uh, and then we used the pump for uh, fire pumps from the ship to fill it with water. So we could sit there. And then this is a typical example of how people behave on such a ship. These two guys, I shared laboratory with them. Um, they are sitting working hard with their laptops. These persons there, they are press people from the press and they do nothing. <laughs> they considered it a fantastic vacation. They were allowed to go on. Uh, so, they were really not very useful to have on board. And then <clears throat> sometimes we made it, most of the time, of course, the food was prepared down in the kitchen of the ship, the cabbage, but um, sometimes we made it on, on, on uh, we made a barbecue on the deck of the ship. That's what's done here. And then it was just up to Christmas. So we had to make decorations for the Christmas things. This is the second commander, commander of the ship. We made a special, uh, no, someone of the girls gave him a model of himself as with the distinctions of the second in command on the, on the shoulder. He was very happy with that. And, and there we are sitting and making Christmas decorations. Um, this is second in command. Uh, this is the doctor of the ship. This is the priest. And these two guys are from the machine room, uh, mechanics people. And uh, this thing here, that's mine. <laughs> but I took the photos, I'm not going to put. So we were sitting and preparing things for Christmas. And then it came to Christmas Eve and we had, that's the only time I ever saw the priest do something. He made a Christmas mess in the evening of Christmas Eve, and uh, in, in the uh, helicopter hangar, where we were all sitting there, and many of us had <laughs> Santa Claus hats on. And then, of course, you need a, a Santa Claus. And I was the oldest one, and the only with a white beer. So I was nominated to be Santa Claus, and I was hissed down with a crane on the deck uh, so to arrive as a miracle from, from above and arrived with my back. And then we had a lot of uh, singing and dancing during the Christmas Eve. And this is the chief in command of the ship, the captain. Uh, he was very fine, uh, a very nice guy. Uh, he ended up being a good friend in, in, in my in lifelong print now. And then we came to the Solomon Islands. And that's really, I mean, for you, it's not that surprising, but for us Danes from the North, these are paradise. And these Solomon Islands were very, very much, they were occupied by the Japanese during Second World War. And there was a lot of fighting going on. But here we arrived uh, with a ship and we had not been made immigration yet, so we were not allowed to go and land. But this guy came up to us to ask if there was a war, because he had seen this warship. That was uh, one of the uh, top uh, navigation officers there. And we explained to him that it was not a war, that it was a peaceful expedition. So he went back to tell the chief of the island that we were not dangerous. And shortly after he came back to us and said that the chief of the island wanted us to come and visit him. And we said, we are not allowed. 
to go and land because we haven't made immigration yet. And the chief sent the message that I decide here so you can just come. The policeman of the same island, he tried to prevent it, but the chief said we could come. So you cannot come to such a place without having gifts. And I mean, we were not at all prepared to bring gifts because we were just in a small uh, zodiac uh, with our diving equipment. So what happened was that uh, um, we had to do something and we all had t-shirts with Galatea, uh, the Mestizia name on. So we gave them all of our t-shirts and had to get back with our t-shirts on. But fortunately they didn't want our shorts too. But I mean, I told you there was a lot of war here and this is an American uh, fighter plane which have fallen down on this island here. You found everywhere on this island, you found remainders from the Second World War. <clears throat> and uh, also a lot of sunken ships and so on. But I managed to collect a few samples here, the coral samples which I brought to the ship. And uh, I tested them to see if they were fluorescent. And here's one which is red fluorescent uh, here, where I extracted the, the proteins to see if they were still fluorescent. So that was uh, my first sample to try to work on. But then we came to our this where we should come an island called Kiso, and that's where we should be for a number of days. Uh, and there's a reef here and a very small opening of the reef. And um, um, the problem we had was I was very much, I like very much navigation. And I went up to the bridge to together with the navigation officers to see. And you see the opening of the reef where is, the, is here. It's a very narrow opening. But the problem was also that when we looked at the nautical map we and it took our position from the GPS, we should be somewhere in the middle of the island. So the navigation maps were not, the sea maps were not uh, accurate or the GPS, but we believe it was the maps. So when I had these two guys on the island already and I called them on the satellite phone and they got out with some of the locals to guide the ship in through here. And that was kind of a very tense situation because the ship had to pass this small opening, follow this small boat. And the captain was kind of nervous. But I said, why are you nervous? You have good pilots to help you. Well, he said, how to explain to the Danish Navy that I just followed a small boat with an outboard motor. But we came in. And here we have the ship in the lagoon. And uh, these islands are very small islands with a lot of people and they move around in boats. These are locals which move around in the boats. And uh, some of them sail with their own old boats, fashion boats. And sometimes they will go out to the ship with big seamen in these small boats. That was kind of uh, quite exciting because would they survive at this trip? And my people had rented this small hut on the lagoon to start to collect samples. And there we can dive directly from this into the coral reef. And uh, <clears throat> they had collected a lot of samples. The only problem was that there was a refrigerator, a gas supplied uh, refrigerator there. And after one day there, there was no more gas and they couldn't get any more gas. So unfortunately, most of the samples were destroyed because they got too hot. But we had anyway, a lot of them. But here are some pictures of these things. We are way down here. There's me coming down there. We have the clownfish, we have the brain coral, we have the dragonfish here. I mean, this typical coral reef uh, fish which you all know from Brazil also. So uh, what do we do to find the hunt for new fluorescent proteins? And our equipment was a yellow filter so that we could exclude the normal life and we could see the fluorescence and we could exclude the blue life.
from this lamp, which activated the fluorescence. This is a, a blue, blue and UV light lamp. So this is what we needed. And then we could see the fluorescence. And uh, here you have a photo taken with normal uh, light. And this is with fluorescent light and the filter in front of the camera. And you see here we have some of these fluorescent things. And you see um, here you have a strange thing with a yellow fluorescence, which was one we collected also. And then <clears throat> what we did was we extracted these samples uh, and looked if they were fluorescent. And then we treated them with uh, the nature conditions to see if the fluorescence disappeared, because if the fluorescence disappeared, then it was most likely a protein. So these samples were then stored and kept. And when we came in in the night, the local people would say our service beer, SP is Solomon beer, and we had with them, and then we could show them our fluorescent samples. And as a matter of fact, now <laughs> they have fluorescent dives for tourists in these islands. They earn a lot of money by that. So we did then in the daytime, we went down to do recognitions to find good spots to dive in the night, because in the night, everything looks different. So you had to know where you are when you do it. And I was convinced that this uh, coral, uh, it's a, a sponge of some kind, um, was through resin, but it was not but it was a beautiful one anyway. So then whatever we, we found of interest, we documented it underwater with photos, with normal light and with fluorescent conditions. And then the position also. And then we selected the samples of interest in small tubes and labeled them to make, uh, let's say, a preliminary test on the ship. And here we have a brain coral and a sea anemone. I mean, I was surprised there were so many different fluorescent things out here that uh, I, I had not expected that. I mean, I knew there was fluorescence. And the reason why I went for this uh, coral reefs was that once at a conference in the US uh, in the coffee break, I was sitting at the same table as uh, as a marine biologist, uh, American marine biologist, and he said, there's a lot of fluorescence in the tropical uh, coral reefs. So that was my only evidence for going as we did for this uh, uh, expedition. So what did we do then on the preliminary thing we did on the ship? We couldn't do everything. I mean, I didn't have mass spectrometers or anything on the ship. Uh, but we could dissect the fluorescent part of the organism, homogenize it. We then did ultrasonic treatment in lysis proper, centrifuge, and looked if we had the fluorescence in the supernatant. Then we did ultrafiltration, the 10 kilo Dalton filter, to see if the fluorescence stayed about the filter. And if it did, it was a pro pro protein because the fluorescent proteins are about 20 kilo Dalton. So, we then looked at, at, at this, uh, what about a filter, and we boiled it with SDS to see if the fluorescence disappeared. If it did not disappear, then we repeated the whole thing once more. But uh, it could be small molecule fluorescence, which we were not interested in. And then this atmosphere, we were frozen in a minus 80 degree freezer, uh, and we had put protein inhibitors and an RNA rescue kit so together with our samples, so we're able to conserve the, uh, the proteins and the RNA. So this was what we did when we came in, and we typically came in with maybe 10, 15 samples. So it took us some time to analyze the samples. And uh, we had to develop all this. But here you see, here's, for example, a, a coral block. And all these things are places where we had fluorescence. That's me in the laboratory. And here we have a, a sample about the filter. It was a yellow fluorescence. And after boiling with SDS, there's no fluorescence anymore. The color has disappeared. 
you can see it here. That's after the boiling, the color has disappeared. So it's, uh, it has disappeared here. And I would say, this is most likely a fluorescent protein. Then we came to an important point, the new year. Uh, and I mean, on this ship, it was absolutely dry. No alcohol was allowed at all. There was one of the press people. He had hidden a bottle of, of uh, whiskey in his uh, cabin and it was found and he was put to land at the first given place because there was simply no drinking on the ship. But on New Year's Eve, we were allowed to drink one beer. We had a number of beers made from a Danish brewery, which was given to us for drinking on the ship for New Year's Eve. Mm. And this was New Year's cakes. And then we made a show, a resin show for them, so the crew who didn't die. So we put the chorus in the pool, and then the local uh, uh, people and the, no, the and the crew members could come and see the fluorescence with these yellow uh, glasses on. So that was our New Year's show. Then <clears throat> I wanted to get most of the time. It was very quiet. I wanted to get a picture of uh, the water coming over the ship, but I mean it was not very uh, uh, not very dramatic anyway. Uh, the ship avoided all the waves, but there was this day some waves, and as a matter of fact, my two companions on my expedition, they were very seasick during this period here. Yeah. They didn't leave the, their bad beds at all. <laughs> and, and then the captain uh, made us a uh, course in navigation, uh, star navigation with a sextant. And I took that course. And I must admit that I admire the old captains on old small sail ships who were able to determine their positions with this. It's very complicated. Uh, I, I placed ourselves, ourselves about 30 nautical ways, miles away from where we were, but our captain, he, he was 60 miles away, so he was, he was not better than me and on the contrary. And then we had a lot of views on the ship. I mean, most of the time we just sail, and we see dolphins, we see flying fish, we see albatrosses, uh, from the ship. And then we arrived to New Zealand and uh, then we had to leave the ship and then rejoin the ship in the Caribbeans. And uh, I had dreamed of being allowed to go on the ship all the way uh, south of, uh, uh, all the way to the Cape Horn and then uh, uh, through the Antarctic and so on. But there were other ship and the ship was full, so there was no space for me there. And I could not argue to go in tropical coral reefs in the Antarctic anyway. But, okay, I just go one day. But uh, we, we came then to the island of San Juan. And uh, in this bay, there was a coral reef and there was a small, uh, let's say, a marine priority station from the uh, from the uh, uh, from the uh, University of the West, uh, West Indies Island. Uh, so we went there and we could uh, uh, borrow the uh, air compressors and the equipment we needed. We had our own equipment, but we couldn't bring the air with us. So they had compressors there. So we went out. And in the meantime, I had increased the number of uh, participants because uh, three persons were not enough. I mean, we had to document, we had to see what we document everything. We had always to be at least one person in the boat to help the other persons if something went wrong and so on. So we increased the number of participants with some of my students here. 
And uh, so we were now six. And this lady was one of the, the wife of one of the participants. She traveled on her own expenses, but she was making coffee with us at three whenever we came up from night dives. And the coral reefs in the uh, Caribbean as not at all as nice as the ones in the Pacific. They were very much destroyed by hurricanes and also um, destroyed by tourists. But uh, there were lots of fish. This is a murine, which kind of attacked one of my colleagues, Martin, when he came out of there. There are some other fish there. And here we made a group photo of some of us um, at a place where there had been a kind of a underwater laboratory which had left, but that's what remains of this underwater laboratory. And then on the sailing, there were fantastic views everywhere uh, from, uh, from the nights. And then I would take you on a night dive. So these are typical samples we use. And these are different things which we found. So you see, for example, this one here has a fluorescent thing there. This one is green fluorescent. This has a, an orange fluorescent thing here. These are all normal light and, uh, and fluorescent light. You see, for example, this is the end of a shrimp which is blue, fluorescent, and so on. There are lots of things. And a big question was, why do we have this fluorescence in the sea? Uh, nobody knows. The mo most, uh, let's say, prominent uh, hypothesis was that it was a protection against damaging UV radiation, uh, which could affect them. <laughs> Because many of these animals live in uh, shallow water in, and with a lot of sun. But we found uh, fluorescent proteins from the deep sea. We found them in absolutely dark caves. So we don't believe that. It can also be protection of, against enemies, camouflage, or it can be attraction of prey, or it can be attraction of partners. We don't know. So. Nobody knows why we have this fluorescence, but it's there. So the preliminary results, we have analyzed over 100 samples from corals and marine invertebrates. And 65 of these samples contained with green fluorescence and, uh, and some contained red, red fluorescence. Uh, some of these maintained the fluorescent properties under the natural conditions. So we think that this was uh, a really uh, <clears throat> a small molecule fluorescence in them. Um, so we then uh, did, decided to go to get uh, enough information from the fluorescent proteins to do cloning and to do reverse proteomics, as I said. And uh, we did the novel sequencing, uh, as you, you have learned already in this course. And what we did was we isolated the, the proteins or the fluorescence, and then we extracted this, the, the, the fluorescence and then we separated it uh, in, in, in a gel, but we made stability tests to see under which conditions could we maintain the fluorescence so that we could follow the fluorescence in the gels. Once we had identified fluorescent places, we did digestion and de novo sequencing, and uh, we moved in to uh, do database search to see if we can find something. And I mean, we found a lot of things um, where which were homologous to 
uh, proteolysin proteins. So it seems that this protein is conserved through a lot of evolution, more or less very uh, much the same protein everywhere. Here you see the stability test where we checked for urea stability uh, in different bulk buffers and SDS stability to see if we could maintain the fluorescence in our SDS electrophoresis. And uh, we found conditions where we could do it. So we had to develop new uh, 2D uh, electrophoretic procedures with new things. And here you have it. Here you can see uh, some of the samples, different samples, where we have seen how much loss we had of fluorescence uh, in 7.2, 7, 7, uh, 6.2, 7.2, and 6.6 .6 molar. <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, and this is an SDS where we see that but we still could maintain the some fluorescence. So we then ran the first dimension gel and looked where in this uh, IEF strip did we have the fluorescence. And then we would cut that out and do the second dimension for that. And here we have the second dimension. And this is a fluorescent image. It's not very clear, but there's a band of fluorescence here. Really. So it's a, apparently a very heterogeneous situation, but it's in the same molecular weight range. And if we then do normal silver training, we can see that it's lots of protein, but this is where we had the fluorescence. So it seems that these fluorescent proteins are extremely dominant in these organisms. Uh, at least in the part of the organism we started, I would say, the ones we dissected out. And then we did try to do MS and MSMS to see if we could identify the potential proteins. And we did mascot search based on that and tried to identify the proteins. But we also did a lot of the new sequencing and um, did MS blasting to try to see if we could find homologous proteins in this way. And we did that mainly with a multi instruments, a multi top top instrument from API, 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 API here. And we used what I showed you yesterday, the speech theoretization to facilitate the manual interpretation. At that time, we didn't have any programs which could help us sequencing. And um, as a matter of fact, the te techniques we used were um, giving the Nobel Prize in chemistry for John Finn the electrospray and uh, Tanaka in Japan for the uh, laser desorption uh, mass spectrometry. He should not have had it. It was Van Tillenkamp and Michael Karras who should have had this Nobel Prize, not him. But I know him very well. I knew both of all of them very well. And uh, as a matter of fact, he, when I met him after he got the Nobel Prize, he came to me and said, are you angry with me, Peter? Because I am not deserving it. <laughs> but I mean, you don't say no when you get a Nobel Prize. So here we have a number of these different uh, uh, things we found. You see uh, lots of different things. Uh, uh, in the, we had spots here and here and here. And, and very often it's a series of line of spots, which shows that it's a lot of isoforms of the same protein, or it's maybe partially geometrated. I mean, this is a different dimension, which is, uh, the change of pH in, in this system. And uh, here are some of them where we got at least a reasonably good uh, 
identification, uh, which is this one, number one, uh, is uh, do you feel like protein from some species? I don't know what it is. With 40% it covers spring green fluorescent emitting proteins from another species, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you see, some of them we had very good sequence covers. And, um, and it, it really showed up. But my main problem was that I'm not a specialist in marine uh, invertebrates. And uh, I tried to find some people who could help me to identify the species, but it showed up to be very difficult. I never found anyone who was able, based on our photos and uh, from this organism, to determine what, what they were, most of them. So that's a big problem if you don't know what you have, but you can only find that it's fluorescent. But here you have some of these uh, proteins. At that time, we didn't have peaks, so we did an over sequencing directly. From the uh, from the, uh, uh, the spectra, the CIT spectra, and uh, then we did uh, MS plus to try to find uh, something from that, and then we tried to get to uh, some identification. But I mean, most cases we could not identify it because they were not nowhere. But very often we came out with matches more or less good for some green fluorescent proteins. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what we also did was, uh, that was one of my colleagues, Finn. Um, he's a microbiologist. And he studied the, uh, um, the proteins from, uh, um, from this uh, extracted protein uh, or extracted DNAs and messenger RNAs from these organisms and searched them and he came to the conclusion that there were in all our samples, there were lots of different species. And they were, most of them um, were, as a matter of fact, microorganisms living on the, uh, on the corals. So you see, there are soft corals, the beta organisms, the dinoflagellates. Uh, and uh, symbiotic with the soft corals, and there are small predatory animals related to jellyfish and corals. So, I mean, a lot of these things, it's an extremely complex situation. And the question is, how do we find the right, uh, the right uh, protein? And how do you isolate this protein? So, uh, but we, uh, have investigated that anyway to see how complex it is. And that's in general now, it's well known that the, let's say, these corals, uh, coral reefs are extremely complex situations biologically in this situation. But <clears throat> anyway, the Danish uh, TV wanted also to make something uh, interesting. I mean, so such so crazy scientists who go out diving in tropical coral reefs among sharks and so on. That was something which they liked to show. And so we invited them to come to my place. I live on the coast, just to, I have a sea centimeters from the house. And I said, let us go out and take a dive and see if we can find something fluorescent in Denmark. And we went out. We had been out testing before. As a matter of fact, it was in January, it was damn cold. <laughs> but we found this animal here, or here, which is, had a golden fluorescence. And uh, it was in the, uh, what do we call the gills, which sit on the outside of this animal. So we, of course, were in, the, in also, to see what we could find of fluorescence, with fluorescence, oh, sir. with fluorescence and with uh, just uh, silver staining, and um, and we studied the 
fluorescence of it, the fluorescence strict uh, profile of it. And it has a very nice fluorescence of around 500, which would be very good for making what's called threat tests. Uh, so we said that was very interesting to find that. And we have it just outside my windows. Uh, and we got also a lot of potential protein uh, information, but none of that was with any reasonable uh, coverage. And it is uh, the naked sea snail. So we decided to find more of this and to, to use it, but we never ever found it again. We have searched for it several times and it was just a lucky case. <laughs> we never ever found it again. And it showed up, <clears throat> we found the same type of snails, <clears throat> but no fluorescence at all. <clears throat> and it showed up that apparently what fluoresce is not the snail itself, but it's something it eats, which uh, it has to, it has to have the right uh, thing to eat to fluoresce. So we have never found it again. It was, a, as a matter of fact, a very interesting one, but it, it, we, at least the TV show worked because we came out of the water and we had the whole TV group and we said, oh, here's fluorescence and you. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I mean, we never found it again. But and this is the fluorescence gang, which was in the last one. Um, Nikolai is now uh, running a company uh, with uh, LCMS things. Uh, I'm here. This is his son uh, who worked with Nova with finding fluorescent proteins and their wife, the, so, so there's a family. This is Martin, who is still very active in our group. And this is Kristoff, who is a Polish and he's a very expert diver. He was to, <clears throat> training us for diving first. And <clears throat> when he was diving us, or training us, um, <clears throat> then he was very careful with me and uh, followed me. He was not very careful with Martin. At that time, Martin was a postdoc. And I asked him, why are you so careful with me and not with Martin? He said, okay, if I lose you, I will lose my job. If I lose Martin, that would be a position for me. So he, that was his joke, of course, but still. And then um, we have some other people involved. And Lena uh, was involved in developing the laboratory test. She's not here in the proposal, but she is uh, the wife of this guy here. And uh, she was a PhD student from Poland here. And Finn was the one uh, who made these tests with the RNA uh, to, with the first year students projects. So this is a fluorescence gang. And <clears throat> my Wayne thanks goes to the Danish Expedition Fund who sponsored the whole part of it uh, in terms of uh, uh, allowing us on the ship and uh, to the ship and his crew for a fantastic experience. I mean, it was really a dream thing to come on. And then I had a big uh, award from the Novo, the Novo Foundation, uh, which financed uh, our traveling and uh, equipment we needed on board. So we had a very good uh, situation here. And with that, I would say thank you to you. So, you are welcome to ask questions. It was a long lecture, but it was a fantastic experiment. And uh, it stayed with me for the rest of my life. Thank you, Peter. Always nice to see that uh, expedition. I would say that it's very strange to sit here in front of a computer screen. I usually can see you. I can see your eyes. I can see what goes on. And here I have no feeling at all. You may all be sleeping now. No. Okay, everyone. Questions? Yeah. Uh, while the 
think about their questions. Uh, I have a question for you in that uh, I think I never asked you that. You, you found proteins that are similar to, to the GFP, but uh, did you look for or did you find any fluorescent peptide? No. I mean, we, uh, we, 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 we only look for, I mean, we, we, in, in the way we worked, uh, we would not see the fluorescent peptides because we looked only for something about 10 kilodalton because we wanted to find something which could be used as uh, tools in molecular biology for cloning and for making fusion proteins. Uh, oh. But and there are for sure also fluorescent peptides, uh, but we haven't been looking for them. And we were not equipped for that uh, as on, on our expedition. Right. But I'm sure, I, I mean, I'm sure there are much, much more fluorescence. I mean, it was, Surprising. So when, whenever you dive, in the daytime, if you see something. In the night, it's totally different. But it's fluorescence everywhere. And uh, it's so fantastic to see this fluorescent world down there and in all different colors. And I mean, that's something which you can really do in Brazil. Uh, not so much in Brazil. Yeah, I don't think there's so many in, the, like, in Brasilia. Yeah. But I mean, in your color, if it's around, uh, and all what you need to experience that is a UV lamp, which you can buy uh, uh, in, on the internet. It's not very expensive. And, uh, and a yellow filter. <laughs> and then you can go out and see the fluorescence if you can, and you can find it by snorkeling because most of the fluorescence is on rather low water. So you don't need to have it even, uh, uh, let's say, scuba diving equipment. Yeah, you just need a UV light and proper glasses. So, and any students want to ask questions? I don't bite. Uh, Professor Peter Hopstaffy, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you and many thanks for the great presentations. Uh, I have so many interested with the fluorescent protein. And in my case, it, I just to fuse my gene of interested with uh, fluorescent protein, specifically with the GFP, just, just to understand the localizations of my protein. Yeah. So yeah. in my cases, I it's necessary to uh, apply the UV UV radiations to analyze it, these uh, subcellular localizations of my protein. Uh, I, I would you like that to uh, talk just a little bit more about your expeditions. Did you discover uh, any protein or any kind of peptide uh, flu uh, that fluorescent without uh, UV radiation? No, uh, I mean, we, the way we looked for them was in the night time with UV, uh, blue, UV, blue and UV light lamp. Uh, and uh, we would not have seen anything uh, beside of that uh, because, I mean, it was so unexpected to us, the whole thing that, <laughs> I mean, today I would probably do it differently. <laughs> but at that time, I mean, it was all new to us. So we really looked for fluorescence, protein, for fluorescence caused by, uh, by, by, the, uh, uh, by this blue UV and blue and UV light. Uh, and we would not have found it differently. But I think uh, you, you need to activate the fluorescence in some way. And I mean, the one, I can just go Slides back. Um, uh, let me uh, fluorescent protein is very common in, in these organisms uh, in the ocean, in the sea. So uh, I'm I'm think about about that. Uh, meet you. Like a a, a Valde, like a, a a question of of Valde. 
A question of what? I'm not sure I understand your question. But I was just taking this slide here to show you that the one we found in this naked snail here is has a maximum fluorescence about 500 uh, some um, nanometers and it's activated from here. So it's activated by much uh, lower, way, uh, much, much higher wavelengths. So this could be a very interesting one because this could be used to activate its fluorescence by another fluorescent protein, which is a technique called FRET, F-R-E-T, F-R-E-T, uh, which could be an interesting one, but we have not been able to, to refine this protein at all. That's our problem. I mean, uh, I, I'm sure that there are lots of things which can be done, and I've not had a possibility to go back on another expedition yet, and I'm not sure I will get that chance, although I have calculated that, uh, I mean, from the first to the expedition to the second, there was 50 years. From the second to the third, there was 25 years. So if there would be a, another one, uh, then I should be around 90 years old and have a chance. But I don't think I will get the chance anyway. So, uh, but I think there's lots of things to do for anyone who are interested in this. And this uh, fluorescence pro uh, problem is extremely fascinating. So, uh, for someone who is interested in nature and in understanding what goes on in nature, it's really worthwhile to go into. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Professor, for the for the lecture and, and sharing with us your your experience. I was just wondering, you mentioned that you maybe you would do something different if you could could go back and do it again, or maybe apply different techniques that are more uh, up to date today. If you if you had the opportunity to do it again, would you change anything in the way you collect samples or in the way you analyze them using uh, different technologies? I mean, first of all, our technologies to uh, identify the, the samples is much better now than it was at that time. Even though we had, uh, we could do MSMS and we could sequence by the mass spectrometer, uh, we had uh, not the same. I mean, the the time of uh, programs we had to search for homologous proteins and so on was much less uh, than it is now. Uh, so, I mean. There are lots of possibilities uh, to, to do that. Con collecting the samples, well, then I would have a bigger team, team and I would have a bit better way to store the samples. But that was a problem. I mean, out there, in especially, uh, especially in the Solomon Islands, I had no freezing capabilities. Uh, only the samples I could bring back to the ship, I could freeze those in the minus 80 degree freezer, but uh, the rest of them were more or less destroyed, unfortunately, because they were not cold enough. So, but there were many things we didn't know about that. I mean, it, that's the uh, advantage of uh, the, the ton of being a scientist. That is that you have to do the experiments and to get some experience first, and then you will see what, it, what you get. And I think that there should be a lot of possibilities to go on new expeditions. And for example, I'm sure that in the waters around Brazil, there are lots of things which could be done without having to have a big ship. Uh, yes, I can imagine there are a lot of more interesting things to be discovered. So thank you for the, for the inspiration. Yeah. So, how is the course going? Are you finished now? Yes, today is the, the last day. Uh, this afternoon, we'll have the last uh, presentation from the students, the last seminar, and then it ends. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, it was a pleasure to talk to you, 
But I mean, I prefer by far uh, to be present. <laughs> Yes. Because then I can see your eyes, I can see your interest. Uh, it's a, a computer screen, it's not the same. And I've been for many years, been giving it more or less this course in, in Brasilia. But this time, it was not possible because of the COVID. Yeah. Uh, I think Reynaldo has a, a question. Uh, actually, Professor, I, I'd like to to thank you for the, the great lecture, uh, Professor Peter. It was really an uh, inspiring lecture. It, it gives me something to, 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 to hope, to, to, to look forward in, in, in science. Uh, and I, I, I guess I, I'd have to, to say it to you because it was really inspiring. Yeah, uh, and I would say that, uh, I mean, my message to you is Never give up your dreams. They may be possible <laughs> one day. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, I had to wait uh, almost 50 years before I could fulfill my dream. Yes. So, and it, was, it certainly was inspiring to, to all of us, I'm sure, I'm sure of that. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, um, and I, I'd like to, I have to know this word in, in English. I never remember. Uh, aproveitar. I'd like to ask you also uh, about the the the, uh, the 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 follow up of the this this research with this this GF, these fluorescent proteins. Uh, are any of them were were used and applied in this in, in industries or something like that after these studies? No, I don't see. What has happened was, at that time, uh, we believed that we should go out in nature and find new proteins. But in the meantime, the, the genetic manipulation, you can make almost anything based on the, let's say, the well-known uh, scaffold, the clean fluorescent protein. So you have engineered now different colors, you have different uh, stabilities and so on, <laughs> based on the clean fluorescent protein. But I'm sure <coughs> that there could be some explanation picked up by other, uh, other of our proteins. But some of them showed up that they only flu were fluorescent if they were uh, in interaction with another protein. So oh. that was to make it more difficult to use in, uh, in science because yeah. you would need two proteins to interact to get the fluorescence. So there <coughs> are many things which we know now, which we didn't know at that time, but I still think that there's a lot of things to do. Yes, but, but it, it's also an interesting aspect that a, a complex only only gives light in complex format. Uh, I, I think it's also have its application even in biotechnology. Yeah. Biologically, <laughs> it's very interesting and may have some, some application in biotechnology. I'm, I'm sure it has. And yes. <clears throat> I really think that there's a lot of things to do. And I mean, I'm, I'm a protein chemist and I had to learn a lot about molecular biology <laughs> to, <laughs> to understand this. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I'm still more fascinated by the proteins. <laughs> so thank, thank you again, Professor. And it was welcome. a great lecture and a pleasure uh, watching it. You're welcome. So, uh, Wagner, I just would like to let Peter know that every time he come or online or every time he comes to Brazil to give lectures, me and other students get so excited and oh, we should cancel all the things we have to had to do today because we have Peter class, and I would like to thank you another time and just. Do you still have any projects with uh, professors in UNB or any other well, I think university we, in Brazil? We, <clears throat> we still have some, some projects going on uh, together with, uh, <laughs> with Mark and Mariana. For example, we, are st we still haven't finished this mapping of all these uh, crazy uh, frog skin proteins together with Mariana. 
uh, and we also have a lot of other things to, to do. So I, I hope <coughs> that we will continue to have collaborations in the future also. But I mean, I, I'm getting a little bit old, <laughs> so I'm 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 a 70, uh, 77 years, 78, nine years now now, and be 79. Uh, next summer, so I'm, <coughs> my capacity is limited, <coughs> but I still think that maybe I can still do something and inspire some people. Of course, Ki. <laughs> uh, last time you came to Brazil, I took a picture with you, and every time people say, oh, it's Peter Hofstoff, so yeah, I have a picture with him, <laughs> and I show it to everyone. Yeah. Well, <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> But unfortunately, I have <coughs> recently been uh, sick of some strange things. Uh, I haven't been sick all my life, but in this last year, I have had several problems. But I think I will pass them. So I'm optimistic that this summer I'll be okay again. Yeah. I hope so. We're, we're all hoping so. And. Uh, You'll be here visiting us, hopefully by the end of this year or maybe next year. Yeah, I hope so too, because I love Brazil and I love the Brazilians. And especially, I love the Brazilian girls. Although my new companion in life, she is from Venezuela and not from Brazil. <laughs> Uh, Carol wants to talk something, ask a question. Go ahead, Far. Hi, Peter. Um, I just want to take a chance because it's the first time that I'm having class with you. But the last time you were in Brazil, I was still an undergraduate student. And I literally did what Anna said. I skipped class just to see a lecture from you. And I just want to thank you. Thanks, Wagner, to give the chance to have this class with you. And well, GFP is a protein that I'm sure I'm going to use in my project because I study in Terectum. And I hope we can use this new fluorescence protein too, just to, just to test. And I hope that we can think about future collaborations too, because well, you're the king of proteomics and I would be really glad to do something with you. And well, as Anna said, um, I hope you can come to Brazil again so we can meet in person formally after this class. Yeah. Thanks a lot. But I mean, as some of the people have, uh, with whom I have collaborated a lot in Brazil, as most of them come from uh, from University of Brasilia, but also I have from Belo Horizonte, uh, Thiago and uh, Marcela, and then from Rio, uh, uh, Silvato Tumong and uh, some of his students. So I have a lot of people around Brazil which I would like to go and see. Sure. We have to bring you here. Yeah, but I will find a way. <laughs> when when this damned uh, Kobe has disappeared. <laughs> yeah, let's get rid of this nasty virus and uh, resume normal lives. Yeah. But I guess that for, for, for Denmark, we are through the worst this summer in June, July, July maybe. But uh, I don't know how it will be in Brazil. Yeah, uh, we have a complicated situation here. Not only the virus, but some people that are not uh, not fighting the virus as they should. They are more interested in fighting each other than fighting the virus. Yeah, but <clears throat> that's a general problem with politicians. Yeah, but uh, we'll go through them and uh, win this fight against the virus. Yeah, I should just show you my view from here if we it's really beautiful today um, from my windows. Oops. Just a second.
you see the view? Can you see uh, the view outside? Yeah, now it's showing the, the sky. What? The sky, okay. So uh -huh. that wow, that's a wonderful view. It's a, I mean, it's a, a, a sound which is just in front of my house and uh, I'm centimeters from the water. Yeah. And it's That's a sunshine cool. day, but it's a pretty cold day. Yeah, but even though it's cold, it's a, it's a very nice view. It's a beautiful day there. So, Peter, thank you very much for yeah. this uh, inspiring lecture and for inspiring all of us with your positive uh, energy, with your uh, very uh, nice thinking and nice talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, anyway, give hugs to everyone I know around and also to, of course, to Mariana and to uh, Lucas and Gabriela. Sure, I will. Thanks. Yeah. And your dog. <laughs> yes. Thanks. A big hug to all of you there. Yeah. Fine. Okay. And See you then. But now at least we can, now we can make this, uh, this work, the, 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 the Skype. Yeah. Sure. And uh, for the students, we see each other this afternoon at three. There's the last seminar. Yeah. At three o'clock today. Okay. And then they are all experts in protein mass spectrometry. Yes. <laughs> well, it's not, you're probably not experts, but it's good to know that it exists. Yeah. No. Because I mean, I've been working with it for more than, let's see, how many years? Since uh, 90, 19, 19, uh, 1962, 66. Yeah. Since 1966. And uh, I'm still not finished. So uh, <laughs> I was learning to write, and you were learning, you were teaching mass spectrometry. Yeah. Okay. But then bye bye to all of you. Bye bye, Peter. Thank you. Bye.